let me now just um, take a moment and to tell you uh, a little bit about our speaker and to begin by telling you why we're here. Well over a year ago, uh, as we began to think on the board of Needle's Eye about how to celebrate what God has been so faithful to do to give us 35 years to minister in this community, to the, primarily to the business and professional community, one of the things that we wanted to do to just show our appreciation for his faithfulness is to try to present something to the community that would be of help for all of the Christians, whether they be from the more liturgical or the more independent church. And as you know, Needle's Eye basically is a ministry to the business and professional community, but we believe that over the last number of years, the whole issue of truth has really taken a hit um, within the church and, without the, uh, and outside of the church. So it seemed good that we would find a time to have a seminar such as this, and we wanted to bring in a first-class scholar and communicator who could really address the issue on the transformational truth topic, the relevancy and reliability of Scripture in a world in which most people don't care about truth. And it's uh, evident within our political systems and even within our churches. Doug Stewart is such a man. Uh, several of us here studied under him at Gordon-Conwell. Let me tell you very quickly just a little bit about him. He is a first-class scholar. He is currently continues to serve as, the professor of Old, as a professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell. He teaches from, uh, uh, poetical books, the prophetic books, survey courses, exegesis, interpretation, commands 17 languages. I'm not really sure how you command 17 languages, but I know he does. Uh, he is well known throughout the academic world, but also known throughout the world of media. He has appeared on Mysteries of the Bible, uh, public broadcasting systems, uh, 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 public broadcasting actually uh, shows such as um, Christianity the First Thousand Years. He is regularly called on for TV and uh, interviews in college and university uh, lectures. More personally, he is an absolute lover of missions, goes on short-term missions regularly and ministers even to gypsies in Europe. He and his wife, Gail, have eight children. And interestingly to me, they own two tree farms in New Hampshire, which tells me this man understands business, sales, marketing, etc. So there's an affinity there as well. We heard him yesterday with a pastor's lunch. I studied under him and was one of my just joys of my seminary career to be one of his students. You're in for a treat today. Would you join me in welcoming our speaker for this Saturday event, Dr. Doug Stewart. It's a real privilege to be able to be here, and I thank you for coming today, and I thank you for the faith that the leaders of this conference and seminar knew you would show, because they planned for you to come. They expected you and uh, made all the prior arrangements with uh, all of the advanced preparation, uh, anticipating your willingness to spend a big chunk of your time today. So uh, good for you. I thank you for that. I thank you for your interest both in the truth side of the seminar today and in the um, uh, applying of it in terms of its relevance to us. Now I think you understand that there's no way in a simple one-day session, long as it is with all the component parts that it'll have, that we can do everything. We can't do everything, but I'm going to try today to put before you some resources. Just, I'm not going to mention a lot of them, and some of them are resources that I've written. I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of those and why they might apply, or they, they're things I've contributed to. Uh, especially, I'll do that in order to increase sales. No, <laughs> not really. Uh, but part of what 
God seems to have laid on my heart in these years that I've been writing, and that's a lot of years, is to, to try to get across to people who are not experts and are not expected to be experts and are not trying to be experts on the Bible, the, a distillation of what we who are experts have learned. Uh, I have a very incredible job. I am paid to study the Bible. That's really a blessing. And I know that's a blessing. And I thank God for that privilege. I want to try to help you today get some of the blessing that that represents. And it's simply by turning around and taking what I have been able to learn in some kinds of areas, in some ways today, we can't do it all, and try to transmit it to you. Now, I'd like to point out that we ha live in a world that is increasingly secular. Most of you know that. There are many places in the world where that's not happening, that's becoming increasingly Christian, but we in the United States, here in North America or in Europe, we are in a place that's increasingly secular, and you can see it in all kinds of ways. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we had Bible reading in school right straight through from first grade to twelfth grade. Um, there were prayers. It was a regular sort of thing to talk about religion. In my senior high school class in Lexington, Massachusetts, a very liberal, secular town, we had uh, a senior course in the Bible as literature, and so on. That kind of thing is gone. It's nowhere that I know of. Now, I realize I am here in God's country as opposed to Massachusetts, so quite, quite possibly I am reflecting my own despair. Just forgive me, and the snakes will get it out of me in due time anyway. Um, but as you know, I'm sure you've all sensed this and seen it, our culture is increasingly relat relativistic. And that means basically that people do not think the truth exists that is really true for all times and places. So there's this feeling that what's true for you may be true for you and that's fine, but that's not true for me. And that the notion of truth is simply limited and relative. People feel that way. It makes people in part uninterested in truth as a motivation for their behavior. That is not what many people think. And the younger you are, the more likely it is that truth is way down the list in terms of a motivation for your behavior. Why do this? Why do that? Um, an awful lot of uh, seniors in high school right now applying to colleges are not asking the question, which college will allow me to gain the best perspective on truth? They're saying, which college can beat the heck out of Alabama or something like that? Or which college has the nicest ratio of girls to boys? Or what kind of uh, crips do they serve in the cafeteria for breakfast at 11.45 and so on? So there is a cynicism about truth claims, and I would say some of it justified well in an election year. We, we understand, we see people making all kinds of claims. <coughs> These claims couldn't possibly all be true. Everybody's tax plan can't be the best uh, since they are contradictory, but there's a tendency for this kind of thing to be done and yet a cynicism to grow about it we live in that world and therefore people are often jaded and disillusioned and uh, they can say what is truth just like a certain Bible character is quoted now some of you are here in churches or denominations that don't hold a high view of the Bible and that may be one of the reasons you came today and I hope you feel especially welcome um, here you get to think about and pay attention to uh, things that relate to the truth of the Bible. 
And uh, I'm going to present some of those kinds of things. I'm sure some of what I'll say you haven't heard before, and some of you may have heard, but not exactly in the way I'll say it. So I hope that's helpful. And, and I just want you to know that I know some of you are in that category. Some of you are in churches that don't teach the Bible as God's infallible or inerrant word, even though your hunch is or your conviction is that it is. And um, I'm delighted you're here as well. Some of you may not have had much of a chance yet even to think about the implications of an inerrant Bible, the Bible that really is true in everything that it asserts. And especially you may not have thought about the implications for others of that, how you relate to other people. If you believe that, what does that make you as a person? And, and I'd like to talk about some of those things. Again, some things may be 20 seconds worth. Some things may be 10 minutes worth. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm, I'm uh, here with a lot of ammunition to try to pass on to you. I, I hope some of it you really do find useful. And uh, some of you may consider the Bible entirely true, but you're not sure why that's all that's so important. Yes, I do, but what if I didn't? Would it make any difference? Don't I know God through Christ? And am I not a worshiper? So... Who cares if the third chapter of Habakkuk can be confirmed by archaeology or not? No, that might be the kind of question you come with. Especially if you're in the business community, as I know many of you are, and of course we appreciate so much the, all the effort uh, by the, everybody connected with and everybody supporting Needle's Eye Ministry to put this uh, seminar together, you probably do not see the Bible used, referred to, lived out all that much. The, the person next to you at the office, either in the next room or maybe next desk, probably does not whip out his or her Bible at lunchtime and uh, spend time pouring over it so that it's noticeable to all. Chances are that's not your experience. Chances are when you go into a store or you are there in the store and somebody comes in to you, the first thing they say is not, hey, what did you learn from the Word today? Uh, those kinds of things aren't frequent. But <clears throat> if you are in the business community, I am thrilled to have you here precisely because surveys show business people are the most realistic in our society. If you're a scientist, you are less likely to understand uh, what really life is like, what people are like. I'm insulting all the scientists in the room right now, so too bad. How do you like me so far? Uh, even if you're a physician, if you're a lawyer, if you're a politician, if you're a psychologist, a writer, and especially if you're a scholar, they're hopeless, uh, you, are, you are less likely to understand why people do things, how hard it can be to deal with difficult people, how many complications there are to life, how many risks there are in life. But business people know this. They, they know it because they experience it all the time. When you've got to make a payroll every week or every two weeks or whatever it is, um, uh, that's a reality. When you've got to deal with all sorts of people and you know that that is going to happen to you every single day when you open the shop or when you go on the road to visit or whatever it is you're doing, um, when, when you're going to answer the phone each time and you pick it up and it may be somebody calling with an unfair and uh, impatient complaint and it's your job to handle that, that's a lot more reality building than what I get to do. You know, when I'm on sabbatical, which is something that they do for professors to humor them, that, that is, they let us off periodically and actually pay us not to teach, but to study so that, in theory, what we teach will actually constantly be uh, renewed by the research that we do. When I'm on sabbatical, I get to go into my office at Gordon-Conwell and close the door and just study and uh, read and write all day long. And many's the time, if I don't see a colleague in a hallway, I'll just go in, do that all day long, and do it for hours and hours and hours, and uh, leave after dark and, and drive home. And I haven't talked to anybody. 
I think that's great. I love that. Um, uh, so, you know, scholars have a mind for that kind of isolation very often. Uh, but if you're in the business community, uh, you know that's not a luxury you are afforded. You aren't isolated from reality by any such artificial means. So good for you, and I trust that you will be blessed by this. But you may not read the Bible more than other people do. Nevertheless, um, you are more likely than many other types of people to know that you need it, to realize, to understand that you actually do need the Word of God. Now, goals quickly. We want to look at how the Bible can be God's infallible Word so that what it says is actually and simply true. Uh, we'll do some of that. Now, again, this is not an exhaustive coverage of every possible issue. We're going to look at the Bible's validity and relevance. That's been advertised. We're going to try to honor that. We're going to look at some difficult passages as samples. They are only samples. <clears throat> the Bible's a big and important book, and it comes from God, and we would expect that someone as intelligent as God would communicate some things that would require us to work hard to understand. But I'm going to try to take some sample passages to show how it is that context can be essential for avoiding misunderstanding and skepticism. We're going to try to see the Bible as what it really is, a loving road map from God. Um, I was in Chicago recently and got a road map of the kind you usually get at the car rental agency. I don't think the people who make those maps up love me. They're very difficult to read. They usually have uh, everything but the highway you're looking for, everything but the section of town that you want to really understand. Uh, God has done something different in the Bible. It's a very big book, and in a way, it has a lot of little maps and some big ones all together, and it's very much his desire that from the Bible we would learn how to live, what, our, what we are, who we are, why we exist, and what our purposes should be and how we carry those out. That's a beautiful thing. If you've got guidance in something as big as life and death and life after death, that's nice. We'd like to see today that we can't pick and choose what we want to believe. Um, and I will uh, hopefully say some things that will help you appreciate that. <coughs> I'd like for us to look at some of the kinds of points the Bible makes that may even be difficult to believe. And I'd like us to look at how the methods of studying the Bible uh, affect the likelihood of actually understanding it. That's important. How you approach something has an awful lot to do with whether or not you're going to understand it. Um, I, can, I have a little address book and appointment book here. I could take the approach of saying, you know, if I put this close enough to my brain, maybe it'll all just gravity-wise slip right down in. But it's a lousy method for finding your phone number in there. Uh, there are methods that are good and methods that are bad. And they have an awful lot to do with uh, whether or not we're going to figure out what's going on. Um, I'm hoping that you might be able to try to imagine how you could help other people also realize that the Bible's relevant and uh, reliable for them. That would be nice if you came away not just with a degree of satisfaction in your own mind about uh, what you had felt you had learned, but with a little bit of awareness of how of some of the things, some of the concepts, some of the perspectives that you could pass on to others. Some of you are probably Sunday school teachers. Some of you may lead Bible studies. Some of you may participate in Bible studies. Some of you may uh, be eager to share your faith, but it has always been difficult. Maybe some little part of today's uh, seminar will pay off in that regard for you. And we'd like to think together about what truth, truth actually is whether absolute truth is important or not. And I'm hoping we can answer questions as, as often as possible and as they arise. So I'm going to try to allow time for questions. Now, if you are like most of my students or like most of the members of the congregation of the church that I also pastor, you have not been trained in public speaking. So if I recognize you, 
what I am likely to hear, unless you are extra careful to be really clear, is something like, I like the practice of strength of mine sometimes because I don't, I have no idea what's wrong. I'm like, oh, sorry, was that, can you answer that? And so please do, if I call on you, remember, shout it out so that I can hear it. And, uh, and then uh, it'll also help us get the snakes out of our mind. If you're extremely clear, we can move on from there. And so I would like to keep the seminar appropriately interactive. We'd like to do that. We can, you know, uh, there's a balance always. As a teacher, I know that if all I do is answer questions from students, uh, unless they know all the right questions to ask, the class will not learn as much as if I actually say some things to them that are not just answers to questions. So I'm going to say a lot, but I'm going to try to leave time in each uh, occasion for responding to things. Now I want to talk about first uh, some couple of things related to archaeology and the accuracy of the Bible. And uh, I've got a little bit of a separate um, uh, 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 presentation here that I've just titled Reliability of the Bible, so you see me turning to that. First I want to show you something. I, th these are just kind of visual aids. Um, I know that the Gordon-Conwell graduates here are already reading through this in the Greek, but um, for the rest of you, let me just explain. It's just a little fragment of the Gospel of John, but look at the date, 120 A.D. Uh, the ability to date things on papyrus, as this particular document is, has increased enormously. I'm actually going to talk about that in a little while, one of the techniques for precise dating. And so we know what the date of this is. And uh, here is witness to the Gospel of John just a few decades after it was written. Now, whether you know this or not, one of the very interesting things about ancient documents is this. We usually have our earliest copies hundreds and often thousands of years later than they actually were composed. <clears throat> you don't have copies of Thucydides. You don't have copies of Homer. You don't have copies of um, any of the great old Greek classics from just a few decades after they were originally written. We have copies of Plato or Aristotle hundreds of years later are the first copies we've got. But with the Bible, so many people wanted to get their hands on every word they could. So many people had committed their lives to Jesus Christ and said, that's it, that orients me. To live for him, that's my passion. That they wanted to find every word of the gospel, every word of the letters, every word of anything from Scripture that they could get a hold of. And it produced a lot of copying. People copied and copied and copied and copied, and that's part of the evidence for the reliability of the Bible. Let me show you something else. <clears throat> In Nehemiah 7.55, I've given a little bit of the context here. You see the name of a guy named Tema there in verse 55. Some of you may have memorized Nehemiah 7.55 as your life verse. Barcos Sisera Tema. It's, it's a short life verse. Maybe some of you read that out when you were baptized. I'd like to read a verse, uh, and here it is, Barco Sisera Tema, and then under you go. Uh, well, anyway, it's, it's a name. Also pronounced in Hebrew, Temach. It's just like whether you would say Doug or Douglas or Rick or Rich or something. It, it can be pronounced another way. It's just a name in a long list in Nehemiah of various people who did various things uh, for Nehemiah as they all came back from exile in Babylon. And this is a group of temple servants, a guy named Tema. Well, there is the Tema family seal with his name at the bottom. Those little scratches that look like they're just sort of nicks or scratches at the bottom. And again, all the Gordon-Conwell graduates have read that already. Uh, they know that says Tema, in, uh, that's Hebrew ancient Hebrew script. In fact, watch out. If you accidentally uh, mix up your notepad with one of the Gordon-Conwell grads, their notes are going to be entirely in Aramaic 
and you'll just waste the day. So, so hold on to your stuff. Anyway, they'll have wasted the day too because they wanted the Aramaic and their English is actually not so good. <laughs> Here's what Eliot Mazar, the archaeologist who found that seal, said. Now this guy is not an evangelical, this guy is not a super conservative. He's a pretty secular Israeli archaeologist. He said, the seal of the Temek family gives us a direct connection between archaeology and the biblical sources. Actual evidence of a family mentioned in the Bible. One cannot help being astonished by the credibility of the biblical source as seen by the archaeological find. Now, what he's reflecting is this. A lot of people think that most of the Bible's just fiction. Many of your friends think that. Many of your neighbors think that. You may have family members who think that. You may think it. You may have come here thinking, oh, isn't most of the Bible just fiction? And so lots of people, including scholars, have said, oh, a list, that's, that's just a bunch of names that somebody centuries later made up and put together to give a kind of a credibility to something. It's all fiction. It's all just human beings in a more gullible age writing stuff to try to produce religious documents. That, that's all. <clears throat> but Mazar says, no. This is amazing. It's astonishing the credibility of the biblical source because this is something tiny. It's one thing to find that, yes, we know where Jerusalem is. Wow! Well, of course we know where Jerusalem is. It's never been lost. But this is the tiny stuff where there was no way to confirm except when you happen to find something. Let me give you another example. This is from a find that is just now a couple of years old. Uh, Jeremiah 39 records for us uh, the fall of Jerusalem, 586 B.C., and the fact that uh, the Babylonians took Jerusalem and uh, besieged it, broke through, and then uh, did what ancient uh, armies uh, did when they conquered a territory. They sat down uh, in the city gates and they had all the citizenry paraded before them. Uh, they bound them, put many of them in chains, uh, others not, usually stripped them down to what we would call their underwear and then gathered them in groups and marched them off into exile. So there was a guy there named Nebo Sarsakim and you see he's called a chief officer of the king of Babylon. And he was an administrator who handled the occupation, just as you have today when any army occupies an area. There are actually officers whose job it is to uh, handle the details of everything from food distribution to um, making sure the, the streets are policed and all that kind of thing in case of the Babylonians to make sure that people were uh, rounded up for exile and that all the wealth of Jerusalem was properly uh, assembled and tagged and sent back to Babylon and so on. Well, there is the Nebo Sarsakim tablet. There it is. Those are my fingers. No, I'm just kidding. Those are not my fingers holding it, but those are the fingers of an archaeologist holding that tablet. And again, the Gordon Conwell grads are scanning this in uh, Neo Babylonian which they don't know nearly as well as Aramaic, but a few of them may be taking notes even in that language. Um, the, it mentions snakes on line two there, John, just so you know. <clears throat> now, here's what a British Museum tablet expert, who again is, is a historian primarily, not uh, a Bible-believing kind of guy. And, and, and look at the way he... Uh, reacts. He said, this is a fantastic discovery, a world-class find. If Nebo Sarsakim existed, and that's the kind of name you could make up. That's just the kind of name. If you were fictionalizing the Bible in ancient times a as a writer from Judah many centuries later, you might make that kind of name up because the name Nebo, that just refers to the god of the underworld um, among the Babylonians. And um, 
it's part of many names. Nebuchadnezzar actually has that same name. Uh, it comes into English finally as Nebuchadnezzar through Greek and through Latin and so on. But that Nebo part is on the front of that king's name and so on. So he says, if Nebo, Sarsakim actually existed, which other lesser figures in the Old Testament existed? Well, I would say all of them. They all existed. But, but he's just so amazed. A throwaway detail in the Old Testament turns out to be accurate and true. Wow, the whole narrative takes on a new kind of power. Well, it does for him, but it doesn't necessarily need to the more you think about these kinds of finds. And that tablet was found only in 2007 in the uh, Jersa excavations in Jerusalem. Now, here's my favorite. I could show you pictures of tablets all day long, and it would be uh, possibly a very interesting seminar. You could go home and say, we saw 283 tablets. Wow. But um, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to show you one more. <clears throat> As an intro to this, Second Kings at the very, very end. The la I'm showing you the last verses of the book of Second Kings. And Second Kings is part of a long story that really begins with Joshua, goes through Judges, and First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. It's the great epic story of the people of Israel from the time they enter the Promised Land till the time they are in exile. And, and so it's a big long story, and in a way, it's a tragedy, because sadly, again and again, they do what human beings do. They throw away the opportunities God has given them. Uh, people do this, countries do it, individuals do it, we all know that. The Israelites, over uh, almost a millennium, did it as well. And so the book ends with Israel in exile and um, just a few people uh, eking out a hard scrabble existence back in Palestine. And it's a real sorry tragedy. The people who had been given a special land by God uh, have now been thrown off that land by people that God brought to do that very thing. But the, at the very, very end, of 2 Kings, we read this. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, he's the last legitimate king of Judah. This is now 560 B.C. 560 B.C., 37th year. Um, a guy named Eel, uh, Evil Merodach became king of Babylon. His name just means man of Marduk. Marduk was the chief god of the Babylonians. That's his name. He, the king is called Marduk's man. And um, he released King Jehoiakim. This is a Jewish king, the, the Judean king from prison on the 27th day of the 12th month, actual date. Spoke kindly to him, gave him a seat of honor higher than other kings. Now there were dozens and dozens of kings of conquered territories there in prison in Babylon for the great Babylonian emperors to show off. See, we conquered all these people and their kings we've got right in our dungeons. That was a thing to boast. People could go visit the dungeons and look at them if they wanted to. Could yell at them, could go, nah, 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 you're stupid, you or whatever they wanted to. So Jehoiakim gets released from prison. He sets aside his prison clothes, verse 29. For the rest of his life, he eats regularly at the king's table. Day by day, he gets a regular allowance as long as he lived. Now, I want you to know that for centuries... Skeptical scholars said, yeah, sure. Come on. That's just obviously one of the clearest, most definitive pieces of fiction in the Bible. It's just something that nobody can verify. Uh, Wheel Marduk reigned only about 16 months and was assassinated. So who, and, and he was kind of an obscure Babylonian king compared to someone like Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> so they said, uh, this is not anything but a little uh, obscure time and you take a guy, Jehoiakim, last legitimate king of Judah, but he had only reigned three years in Judah before he was taken, I'm, I'm sorry, three months in Judah before he was taken into exile. So they say, 
look, you take an obscure Judean king, you put in a story of an obscure Babylonian king, and you have something nobody could prove or disprove. It's just uh, a story about a guy who uh, is favored. So uh, we, you make up this story about the last legitimate king at the end of his life being favored and being given more favor than any other king. It's just a fiction to humor people, to make them feel good about themselves, to give a little touch of the positive to an otherwise tragic story. It doesn't fit. Uh, the story is a tragedy. So this little happy ending, ah, nonsense. And for, for centuries, this was regarded by all skeptical scholars as one of the most obviously fictional parts of Scripture until the tablet that you see there uh, was found. Now, I'm sorry I don't have a bigger picture. The particular grab I could get on this was of low resolution, so if I blow it up, it gets even blurrier. But there it is. This tablet was excavated around 1900 in the Coldaway ex excavations uh, near the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, but not until the 1940s was it read. And that's because, uh, in many cases, thousands and thousands of tablets were brought back and put in museums, and then people had to piece them together. So a, a, a scholar, a very young scholar, named uh, Dan, uh, Donald Wiseman, who went on to be a professor of Assyriology at the University of London, and a great world-class scholar, happened to be reading in the British Museum in one of those extremely dusty, low-light places that I have spent a lot of time in, too. And he began to read down, and he saw to Yaukin. Yaukin, what? And who, who? Yaukin, that's the way you would say Jehoiakin in Babylonian. King of, and then, oh, there's the word, the beginning of the word for Judah, and he begins to read through. Well, I've just given you a little excerpt of this, and it talks about very generous daily distribution of food portions to King Jehoiakim and his family, the five sons of the king, who also were taken into exile with him when he was exiled. They're on the food allotment. And if I gave you the whole rest of the tablet, which we could work on until noon together today, that might be a lot of fun for some of you, but my guess is others of you would like us to move on as soon as I've made some comments here. Um, we could see that it is by far the largest food allotment of any of the various ones described for all the other captured kings on this tablet. Now, skeptical scholars say, well, yeah, the ending of Second Kings is, of course, one of the actually true parts of the Bible. So, um, that's a little sampling. It is a sampling, but I hope it has some value in terms of just giving you a, a feel for, what in the world have I done? Here we go. Uh, uh, gives you a feel for um, the way that, uh, over time, uh, archaeology can really make a difference and can really demonstrate to the satisfaction or, and or amazement of people who are themselves archaeologists about the accuracy of Scripture. Now, that's not the only evidence for the accuracy of Scripture. I want to talk about some other evidences. Um, one is that the number of texts, that is what we call manuscripts, because, of course, before the invention of the printing press, everything written down is a manuscript, a thing written by hand. So that's what we mean. We mean documents written by hand when we talk about manuscript. Um, and uh, there are thousands of them for the Bible, really between five and 6,000, depending on how you count them. That's unprecedented. You might get a very few for um, certain kinds of documents. Um, uh, even for Shakespeare, you have to go into modern times um, really uh, to get a multiplicity of manuscripts back anywhere near uh, his time. Uh, there are very few. But the further you go back in time, the rarer it is. Some of you may know <clears throat> that much of what we know from the ancient world was actually preserved 
by Irish monks. And I think that's simply because they had a choice during those cold, wet winters of either drinking themselves to sleep or copying manuscripts. But I'm not sure. It's just a theory of mine that may not be entirely accurate. Um, so anyway, um, uh, we have manuscripts of the Bible from earlier times and in greater quantity, uh, hundreds of times, generally speaking, uh, more frequently to give us the sort of uh, textual evidence and early evidence of the accuracy of what we're reading. If you compare that to the Koran, some of you know this and some of you won't. You know, it is really technically forbidden to translate the Koran. Um, sometimes it's allowed, depending on the country, and different uh, Islamic countries and different sections of Islam have different kinds of rules that they have uh, uh, adopted in their traditions. But um, they will all tell you that a translation of the Quran is really not the Quran. Now, you know, that's one of the things that makes the Bible very special. There's nothing in the Bible that says don't copy it, don't translate it, don't put it into every language. We who believe in the Bible have a translatable, pan-cultural word from God. And that's part of what has made the Bible so uh, pan-cultural and such a worldwide document. Because there is absolutely nothing wrong with, and in fact every good reason to translate the Bible into everybody's language. Whatever is their natural fluent language, the language of the heart, that's what you want the Bible to get into as fast as possible. So we Christians who love the Word of God, <clears throat> we are translators at heart. We support translation. We encourage it. We pray for it. We financially back it and so on. That's not Islam. Only the Quran in Arabic. Only Arabic. And it is an older form of Arabic than is spoken today. So you know around the world people memorize uh, prayers from the Quran in Arabic and effectively in some places it's taught this way but effectively people are taught that God only listens to Arabic now they would say that Allah can of course understand other languages but he only listens to prayers in Arabic there are many Muslims who believe that many and uh, so it's a very different situation but not only so it's manuscripts of the Koran that you have to go, go quite a bit further along in history before you even get some. And that's just a big difference from, say, Islam and Christianity. Um, biblical texts are from a vast range of times and provenances. Some of the most valuable texts we've got to help us make sure we have every word of the ancient Hebrew actually come from Egypt, not from Palestine. And some are from libraries all over Europe, for example. And we also have an anti-tampering situation going on. Um, you could say, well, didn't somebody way back at some point, maybe the early Middle Ages, you know, um, begin to fool around with the Bible and maybe that's what's going on, or maybe in the early centuries, <coughs> excuse me, after Jesus, maybe the Christians started monkeying with the Old Testament to make it look like it predicted Jesus and they added in things here or there. How could we know? Well, among other things, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They were found in uh, 1949 and um, they were sealed in jars in caves for 2,000 years. They go back as early as 200 B.C., even before Christ, even before there were any, quote, Christians, and they've got the prophecies of Christ. They've got the predictions that we who love the Old Testament see uh, pointing to the Savior and all that he will do so that Jesus was able, as you know, to teach his disciples from the Old Testament all about him and all about who Christ was and what they could be in Christ because it's there predicted in the old that's uh, uh, right there in documents that 
could not be accessed for 2,000 years. Quite an implication. Um, furthermore, there are hundreds in the world of what we call text critics, people whose job it is, people whose uh, passion it is to analyze the exact wording of either the Old Testament or the New Testament or both. A and they write, I've written articles on text criticism, it's one of my interests. There are so many of us that, and we are weird, I want you to know that, that there, we could never get together and hatch a conspiracy to fool you into thinking that the Bible was really an ancient document. <laughs> we couldn't do it. Uh, it would never happen. First, because uh, most of us without a GPS can't find our way home at night. But secondly, because there just are so many vast numbers in the thousands and places and ages and so many people working on those documents from all those times and ages and places to do it. It is an amazing thing. So you want a religious document that is, quote, documented, that's the Bible, like nothing else, way beyond anything else. Uh, and there are thousands of those texts. We are constantly increasing data and methodology. We're increasing the technology. And here's one of the things I want to talk about that was related to that dating of 120 A.D. Um, infrared and 3D scanning techniques, they're now used by your eye doctor. Some of you probably had that where they can uh, look at uh, the depth of your eye and, and get a 3D analysis by, uh, by light penetration. You can do the same thing with manuscripts so as to read them carefully and see even the kinds of inks and so on used and date things that way. But if you happen to have a mass spectrometer accelerator either in your basement or your garage or maybe at your church, maybe your church has one here. I wouldn't doubt that a wonderful church like this one, you must have one, don't you, John? One of them. Anyway, uh, they are amazing to behold. They're really quite big. You, you have to have a pretty big area about a, a quarter of the size of this gymnasium minimum for one of these, and, and usually the machines are bigger. Uh, what they do is they uh, accelerate the differentiation of carbon-12 from carbon-13 and carbon-14. As, as all of you know, carbon-14 is the only radioactive isotope of carbon. I know I don't need to say that kind of thing, but I thought, oh, well, m maybe just a reminder. And um, if you can get that isolated, as happens when you use a, an accelerator, uh, a, a, a special device that costs several million dollars, but that can bombard the nucleus of uh, the uh, carbon material in any living thing. You can take something that was once alive, like a plant, uh, and then was, of course, harvested and made into um, uh, something like papyrus or whatever, uh, or if it's sheepskin or anything else that was once alive, you can <clears throat> uh, assume, as can be pretty well documented, that it has a certain amount of carbon-14 in it when it's uh, original, and then there's a decay life for that. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, your pastors can tell you this, the uh, half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. That they probably, In fact, you've heard that in Sunday school, I know. But um, all of this allows dating really precisely. You can date stuff to within 10, 12 years, and you can even do that with an accuracy of a few hundred years back to 60,000 years ago. It is remarkable what can be done. This has power because it allows us to say this find is from that decade. And because you can do that, all of a sudden, lots of skepticism is simply driven away. It's remarkable. Furthermore, more and more funding is going into manuscript research. Uh, the Green family, if you want to pray for somebody as you enter a store, pray for a guy named David Green as you enter a Hobby Lobby store, because he's a good guy. He makes money off of everything you buy, and he gives it to the Lord's work in every kind of way. But he has put in his family $50 million into the preservation of biblical manuscripts. That's the kind of money that helps. You know, money does some things sometimes. And so um, that manuscript evidence is tremendous. So more scholars than ever are working on it. 
more texts are being collected and collated even as we speak. So if I were to come back in two weeks, I might have more data on this kind of thing. And Gordon Conwell happens to be one of the centers, along with Oxford in England, where uh, manuscripts are now based and where scholars are working on manuscripts. So one of my former students, uh, Kathy Beckerleg uh, McDowell, who now teaches at uh, our Charlotte, uh, North Carolina campus, um, is in charge of that manuscript program. And that's going to yield results that will further confirm things. So, you know, attacks on the Bible, which once, if you go back a hundred years, you can read all kinds of attacks on the Bible from the reliability of the text angle. Ah, can't trust the texts and so on. They've been tampered with this and that has happened. Now, that's just ba basically gone away. You can't do it anymore. There's just too much evidence for it. Now, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about critical theories in the Bible. This will probably bore some people because actually I find it boring. Uh, I don't like it. I think it's silly in some ways, but it's out there. And especially for those who may be students, for some of you who uh, may talk to your kids because they come back from college and they've had a course in Bible and they start to tell you about this, um, for some of the pastors who may have had a little touch of this in seminary, but they're not quite sure still what to think of it, I just want to talk about something called the documentary hypothesis. It's a theory. <clears throat> Starts with a guy named Hobbes and goes through a bunch of people you can tell there, but especially advanced uh, about 150 years ago by a German scholar named Julius Wellhausen that starts with a foundation. And the foundation of it was the prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah and all the rest of the 16 prophets, don't quote Moses. Now they come after Moses, theoretically, so they should say, Hear, O Israel, as Moses taught you, love your neighbor as yourself, but they don't do that. Hear, O Israel, as the book of Deuteronomy says, uh, such and such, love God with your whole heart, but they don't do that. So this lack of citation obviously must be due to the fact that the prophets didn't have the law. The law of Moses must be a fabrication and it must have been written after the prophets. Now most of the prophets uh, prophesied between 760 B.C. and 460 B.C. That's uh, Amos to Malachi, 760 to 460. So it must have come after that. And you know, there are lots of people who still believe that. That's the foundation. The trouble is that citation was not invented until the Roman era. So nobody quotes anything in the whole ancient world until around 100 B.C. A.D., I should say. It should be A.D., 180. It just doesn't happen. So the New Testament is actually the first place in the whole of all ancient literature where people start to say things like, and in another place it says, or as Isaiah says. Now notice they don't quote chapter or verse. They can't. There was no chapter or verse thing. We're so used to chapters and verses, but that started in the 11th century A.D. That started in the late Middle Ages, just as the... Renaissance was beginning to come on the horizon. <clears throat> so you can't, you can't do it the way we do it now so conveniently. So of course prophets don't quote the law because nobody quotes anything. I spent a whole year at Yale in uh, one of my courses reading Babylonian legal texts. Now that would cause some of you to say, ah, yes, it's all clear now. The poor, the poor guy. Wait till you meet me in person. I'm even worse. So um, a whole year. And we read case after case of law problems, court cases, uh, where we ha you actually had the, the court recorder's record of those court cases. Case after case that were directly related to Hammurabi's code, which was the governing law code of that time. And none of them 
ever, even once in any way, cites Hammurabi's code. But they're all governed by Hammurabi's code. They just did not do legal citation, didn't do any kind of citation. It doesn't happen. So poor Wellhausen has had that pulled out from under his foundation, and it was foundational. <clears throat> Another foundation was that the vocabulary varies with the material. You do find somewhat different vocabulary in Deuteronomy from what you find in Genesis and so on. But that has now been demonstrated by very careful studies, really good scholarly studies. Vocabulary is a function of genre. You use different vocabulary when you're writing a postcard from what you would do if you were trying to write a letter to the editor. You're just going to use different phraseology. And you use different vocabulary in all kinds of different contexts. Um, furthermore, another foundation of that theory, Wellhausen's starting point was the Second Kings 22 account about a king named Josiah and the finding of the scroll. And he said, ah, see? Uh, and he said, everything stems from this. This is my starting point. We know that date. Uh, the date happens to be 622 BC. He said, that's where they found the law. It had been fabricated. It was brought to the king. And the first of this stuff, supposedly by Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the beginning of all that showed up in 622 BC as a clever way to fool the king and the other Israelites into believing something that a certain religious group wanted them to believe. The trouble is we have done, we who are in Old Testament and biblical field, foundation deposit archaeology. It turns out that in that document described in 2 Kings 22, the law was found in the temple when they were renovating the temple. And it turns out that all ancient temples in every culture had foundation deposits where people would put something like you put in a time vault today or a cornerstone vault or something. You, you put documents in. Well, this was done. And so uh, finding it in the temple proves its ancient nature, not the other way around. Wellhausen knew nothing about foundation deposit archaeology, first because he knew nothing about archaeology, and secondly because he lived too early. Um, and a lot of scholars, unfortunately, are still clinging to his early ideas. Now, the language of the Pentateuch was assumed date. That's uh, late. That's part of his uh, uh, foundation. And he's just one of the major representatives, so I'm using him as a, an example, as a, a person to sort of bounce this off of. Um, orthographic analysis. If you don't know what orthographic analysis is, uh, it still works. It's just that if you did, you'd understand why. Um, it's a way of looking scientifically at the development of scripts and writing and the style of writing and spelling. And there's a lot of ancient spelling of Hebrew that goes way back to the second millennium BC in the Pentateuch and there's no reason for it to be there if it didn't start from an early time. Furthermore, a lot of what people thought were late words in Hebrew, I was teaching this actually just on Thursday to my class. We were going through the Song of Solomon in, in a class because these are you know, young unmarried seminary students and they're, they're desperate and we're trying to get them ready for the real thing. So uh, we were talking about um, uh, some of the words there, and one of the students asked, what about this particular word? He said, I haven't seen that before. And I said, yes. And part of that is because it does occur in certain of these documents that people used to say that little word is late Hebrew. It's because that was their theory, and they argued that it's found in Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, and these couldn't possibly have come from Solomon. They must be late fabrications from the time after the exile, maybe the 400s or 300s and all this stuff. And, but Ugaritic is another Semitic language, and as it has been deciphered, that little word showed up in Ugaritic. Now, what's interesting about the same word in another language, that little word is in a language that stopped being written in 1220 B.C., long before Solomon. So now we recognize that that word is an indicator of ancient date, not late date. And a lot of scholars are working on these kinds of things that you're not just getting it from me. Another foundation of critical theories was vocabulary variety. 
And it turns out that in all ancient sources we have comparable evidences of vocabulary variety. And again, we could spend all day with my giving you examples of this, but trust me, it's really significant. Another foundation of critical theories was <clears throat> the presence of parallel accounts. You've got in Genesis 12 the story of Abraham lying about his wife Sarah. He does it again in Genesis 20. His son um, Isaac does it about Rebekah in, in Genesis 26. So three stories that are very similar. People said, if they wanted to, well, there you go. Now, that's obvious evidence of sloppy taking from various sources these parallel accounts and awkwardly pasting them together so that you keep reading the same account uh, two times of Abraham and then once of his son. I mean, this obviously is just pure, uh, uh, undebatable uh, evidence of stuff that uh, is just bad, uh, poor quality uh, assembling of an anthology of stories in an awkward way. But it turns out that all ancient documents of this type have um, repetitions. It's part of the style of the ancient world, and the more we study this, the more we know it. And furthermore, ancient annals, which are particularly places where you get such repetitions, are designed to do that. Uh, so you want to read things about the life of a nation over a period of time. You're going to read lots of repetitions, and they aren't indicating different sources. They're confirming a style that was valued. Another foundation for criticism uh, of the Scripture, the determination of sources and texts in general was thought to be something that uh, would be possible to do. You can say, aha, this just sounds like somebody different. The theology is different over here. That's got to be another source. Maybe that's from northern Israel. Oh, this must be from a bunch of priests. They would push this kind of thing. So let's call that the priestly source. It's a kind of atomizing of everything. But it turns out that when scholars have tried over the decades to replicate this, they all disagree. It's very interesting how they all disagree. So literary criticism theories come about, but the problem for them is that oral tradition studies that have been done very scientifically, very, very carefully by researchers have demonstrated that you can keep a lot of material together. You don't have to make up stories. Stories can be transmitted very accurately, very precisely from generation to generation to generation to generation. There are actually people who still can memorize. I know that many of us say, good grief, I can't even remember the name of the person I just met coming into church. But there are people who can do that. And in the ancient world, that was big. Another foundation was scholarly consensus. But boy, has that changed. And a British scholar who himself would basically be, from our point of view, anti-evangelical, has in, in a very important work in 1987 <clears throat> argued that the usual approach that most scholars have taken called the documentary hypothesis is actually the least likely because it's based on the supposed pasting together of disparate texts. And he points out that the authors of the sources avoid duplication, yet the theory says the final redactor, some late person who takes all these late sources and makes them up into the ultimate fictional account, uh, and this by many people who don't even believe Moses existed. They don't even believe that much of the Old Testament. Uh, the final redactor does it in contrary to them. So uh, there was once this neat, easy theory. And some of you may have heard about it. Some of you may have learned it in college yourself. You took a, a religion course or something. The problem is chaos now. The foundation was atomism, everything breaking up into little bits. But now, more and more people have been able to show very carefully, very patiently, the literary and thematic consistency uh, of the Bible. And an example of that is a scholar named Robert Alter, who really has altered get it, our perspective on this kind of thing. So here's a conclusion, very recently written by a scholar named uh, Benjamin Summer. 
the verities enshrined in the older, quote, introductions. Those are these critical theories that say it's all basically fiction. <clears throat> have disappeared. Wow, that is quite a statement. This guy is not one of my students. This is not some fundy who uh, pastors a small startup Assemblies of God church. This is a very skeptical liberal scholar. He says, they've simply disappeared. He's telling you, nobody believes this stuff anymore. In their place, scholars are fronted by competing theories, discouragingly numerous, exceedingly complex, often counts in an expository style that is not for the faint-hearted, in other words, chaos. Now that's actually the current state. There are people who from every kind of angle are attempting to deny the reliability of the Bible. It does exist. And they're going to continue to do that. They'll do it, in my opinion, as long as Satan continues to say, how can I sabotage people? Boy, if I can get them not to believe in the Bible, that would certainly be ideal, would it not? And so I don't think this is something that's going to cease. Besides, just human beings in general tend not to want to trust God. Our default mode is not to say, where's God and how soon can I trust him with my whole heart? Our default mode is to say, what's in life for me? What can I do? And if God doesn't count in there, why should I worry about it? And why should I worry about some book that supposedly is from him? Um, so this kind of chaos will continue, but it is a disorganized attack. It is a whole bunch of people with their own weapons uh, shouting charge with one or two folks behind them from every angle. They're still fighting the battle, but it's a very different battle now. So if that bored you, that's fine. Good for you. Uh, you're, you're thoughtful and intelligent and you recognize what's useful and what's not. But some people did take notes. I watched. So apparently it was of some use to them. Now, let me give you a more subjective argument. You know, there are various ways you think about truth, and there are some ways in which it's uh, useful to have a subjective look at something. What are the best and brightest concluding? What's going on in our seminaries in the United States? There are 247 seminaries in North America. Only about 50 of them are in the evangelical category, the category that really does hold to an inerrant, a really true Bible. So uh, by about a four to one ratio, they don't. It's a very interesting fact, it's real. So a lot of seminaries have gone to the left, have become liberal. Some of you are Presbyterian, uh, I, and, and I want you to know that I still feel okay about being here. I, I'm, I'm completely comfortable. Some of you are Presbyterian, so you know this. You know that your denomination, if you're PCUSA that is, you know your denomination has been on a four-decade decline, down again 3% last year. This year it has slipped under 2 million. The height was 4.25 million. You know that has happened. But why has it happened? It has happened because um, it, it is a uh, result of the seminaries in the PCUSA teaching the kind of stuff that I just went through. That Wellhausen name and so on, that's repeated in those Bible courses. And they have been teaching that consistently to their pastors. And the effect of it is, sadly, that many United Presbyterian pastors and leaders and denominational executives and so on do consider the Bible to be basically a human book, the attempt of prior people in a gullible age to uh, talk about God. Now, they don't find it totally useless in the same way most of us don't find Shakespeare useless. But we don't think Shakespeare uh, really is likely to lead us to God all that well. And sadly, that's what these folks feel. Now, I want you to know that I went to a liberal seminary. I went to Yale. And uh, some of my best friends are Presbyterian. How's that for a... Uh, they really, really are. Some of my best buddies from seminary that I'm still in regular contact with. And many of them are actually proud of that decline. You know what they say? They say, well, we're martyrs. We are holding to 
and openness to all ideas. We're letting everybody from every perspective join us. Our churches are for the worship of God in whatever manner you like, with whatever thoughts you have, whatever you think she looks like, it doesn't matter. We're just glad to have you here. And we want everybody to feel good about marriage. So if men want to marry men or women marry women, that's fine. We think that's wonderful. If you want to have one man marry several women, that's the next step, giving freedom and embracing openness. If marriage ends up being between a man and a couple of horses, that's okay with us. We're, we're on to that. We're comfortable with it. I haven't heard anybody propose marriage between humans and snakes yet, but you know, there are, there are those more charismatic Presbyterians that might just, it could happen. <clears throat> now, you know, there is some goodness in that motivation. I want you to know that these people are not trying to do something evil. They're trying to say, we want to love everybody. But what they're doing is saying, we want to love everybody, so we will make no distinctions even when it comes to truth, even when it comes to the Bible. We will not really ask the question, what does God's Word tell us is right and what's wrong? We're going to say, whatever you want to believe, we'll accept. Just come join us in a family of faith on a faith journey together. Now, some of you may have preached that, uh, uh, or will this coming Sunday, I don't know, uh, because I don't know all of you. But um, that decline is, however, an example of what happens when you get uh, fidelity to Scripture uh, uh, that is uh, abandoned. Now, I hope that you've heard me say it with a, a heart for those of you who are Presbyterians and are experiencing this in your own churches. And if one of you uh, really uh, thinks this way, that marriage should be open of any sort and so on, I've used that as an example. I'm not trying to insult you. I hope I didn't do that. I'm trying to talk about uh, the motivation. So my close pals who are Presbyterians say, we have taken the high road. Those narrow, bigoted fundies can go their way. But we're remaining true to the theme of loving neighbor as self. But the problem is if you believe everything, you believe nothing. And if everybody's good, there is no morality. There's really not any ethical system at all when everybody's good. When all choices are acceptable, you haven't made any choices at all. You aren't making choices. You're just floating through life and so on and so on and so on. And people eventually sense that. So I think there's a sense in which the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I'd like to encourage you to read a book. Now, I know that for some of you, that will never happen. Uh, no, probably this group is very exceptional. But um, I, I mentioned the other night uh, a statistic that I think is always interesting, and it should be useful to us as we keep it in mind, and that is... <clears throat> 90% of Americans report that they do not read books. That is, if you ask them what book have you read in the last year, 90% of Americans can't name one because they haven't. Of that 90%, 90%, I, I mean, of that 10% who do read, who do read books, 90% are women. So only 1% of adult American males regularly read. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll make yourself an exception if you're in that uh, other group. And read a book by uh, Bradley Wright, a new book, just out. He's a professor of sociology at Connecticut. And that's a, 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 a state in the northern part of the United States. Um, and his book is titled, this is now for a university professor, Christians are hate-filled hypocrites and other lies you've been told. A sociologist shatters myths about the secular and Christian media. And uh, he says, actually, evangelicals are more respected today than they were 20 years ago. But you don't know that. You don't know that from the secular media. They will hide that from you as hard as they can. 
He says divorce rates of Christian couples are not the same, which is what I had heard. I'd actually said this in groups. He said it's nowhere near that case. That is the false uh, presentation of the data. He says the percentage of young people who attend church has held steady over the past 20 years. And it's easy to think that just can't be. Um, in chapter 4 of his book, he asks this. I just think these are nice titles. Are all Christians poor, uneducated southern whites? And the answer is obviously not. There are many poor, uneducated northern whites uh, in the church. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> do Christians think and do Christian things? It's a great chapter. You've got to read that because he says Christians are different. Following the Bible and what it reveals about Christ does change people. And if you're one of those who's been changed, you know that change is profound. Wow, does it make us different. We wish it would make us as much more different than we are. We're sorry for the way we're not as different as we should be, but wow, does it work. His chapter 7, Do Christians Love Others? And he illustrates it. He shows it. Then I just wanted to list for you a couple of his appendices, one of them on bivariate and multivariate analysis. This is a sociological study. It's very carefully done. The data are there to prove the point. And finally, his uh, uh, final appendix is on the statistical significance of this stuff. He didn't just interview his mother and two of the friends that he goes to church with. He did a good job of research. Okay, we're stopping at this point from my lecturing, and I want to see if you've got a question. Your first question is from a lawyer. Oh, no. Oh, brother. Oh, this is, this is really trouble. Oh, I, I'm dead. So, Doug, Go I, ahead. I, I appreciate you being here. So what's the response to the PC pastors? You know, what's the, the response? What's the response to then to the PC pastors who believe that they're the martyrs? I mean, what do you use? What, how, what's your response? Yeah. Um, well, I think that the... Uh, the first response always ought to be respectful and loving. It's very important. And, I, you know, I kid around a lot, so in a way, I'm sure, without even intending it, I kind of make fun of certain kinds of things. But I think the first response has to be to recommend to people who are skeptical uh, a good material that helps uh, bring their attention to the facts. We're all... Na narrowly focused. We all see things from a certain point of view. Most of you have no idea what the Harvard football team's record is. I know that. I know that if you had to live or die based on how well Harvard is doing so far this fall, y you would have serious trouble. We we're, all of us are narrow. So part of it is simply saying, would you like to take a look with me at these data, these facts? Um, and some of that is a matter of having good materials in hand. And I've tried to write some of those kinds of books. I wrote a commentary on the book of Exodus. That's a hot point of liberal or leftist criticism of Scripture. Uh, Exodus is one of the books that people say uh, couldn't have been true. This stuff about a bunch of dinky Israelites leaving Egypt couldn't really have occurred. <clears throat> the Egyptians were way too powerful. Living in the wilderness for all those years couldn't have happened, and Moses wasn't real anyway. And I've tried in a mere 840 pages to demonstrate that it actually is true. Now, one of the nice things is that uh, people have told me, I've given that book to our pastor. I've given that book to my friend. I've, I've passed that along because you present a very patient and convincing view of Moses as a real person, he as the author of this material, as inspired by God, and the event's true. So it's that kind of thing. And um, in Gordon Conwell, um, like, you know, it's a very interesting thing. The largest seminaries, you know, I gave you the number 247, but the largest seminaries are the evangelical ones. They are growing, 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 and the others are shrinking. So uh, if you can actually get a person to take a course at Gordon Conway, and we have many of these courses online. People don't have to leave the comfort of their living room in their pajamas, as you see the pictures, with their feet up on the coffee table. They can study this stuff, and we have courses that are, quote, apologetic 
a fancy term for trying to contend for the accuracy of the, of the Christian faith and the Bible in particular. Now that's a quick outline to a very valid, significant question, but I hope at least as an outline it may be of some use and response. One what more, else? One more quick one. One more question. Can you tell me more about the book by Bradley Wright? The book the by Wright? The publisher and where one can get it. Sure. And uh, the usual answer to that is, uh, let me get you back to the title. There it is. Christians are hate-filled hypocrites. So you got two options. One, one of the, the standard answer is always Amazon.com. That's a uh, book distributor in Brazil. Um, but if you're not familiar easily with ordering online, and many people are not, and I understand that, you know, you can walk into any bookstore and say, I want to get a book. And they know how to order books. They can order them from various distributors. Very easy. And if you want to know more about the book, maybe read some other reviews of it and so on, just Google. That's something you do with that one of them new computers they've got now uh, on that worldwide interweb thing they've got. Um, you, you Google Bradley Wright and Christians are, and it would give you information about various booksellers if you want to order it that way. So I think you could have it in your hands in a few days from many different distributors. And, and you'll be very surprised. Uh, a bookstore, your corner bookstore if you have one, they can order stuff very quickly now. They, they've really speeded up the process for this. They can often get you a book. You walk in on Monday, they'll have it for you on Friday. So I recommend it because I think you'd see that what he's doing is saying there is a proof in the eating. This is a good, these Christians do make a difference. What the Bible says about God's ability to transform human beings actually is true. And, and that's, a nice, that's a very practical argument. It is more subjective than a, a carbon-14 dating of a manuscript, but it's true. Thank you so much, sir. Have you enjoyed the first session?